All right, everyone, please take your seats. Uh, our first speaker of this session is Mr. Ben O. Rice uh, from uh, Dell EMC Epsilon and Ipsilon. also from uh, Ipsilon, so, and also from the uh, Isilon, also from the uh, Free, FreeBSD Foundation, uh, here to talk about the trouble with FreeBSD. Everyone, please make him welcome. Hesitant as I am to correct Russell, I'm actually from the core team. The foundation is a separate thing, but that's okay. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Ben O'Rice. Um, so on the Isilon front, uh, they generously paid for me to attend here, so I figure I should give them a bit of a thing. We're hiring. Uh, we're hiring lots of different people. I'll put some more details up at the end. So the theme of this uh, conference is the future of open source. Um, but I'm going to go look at the past of open source because I think it's really important to understand that if open source is to have a future. Um, and FreeBSD has been around for a while, so, you know, I think it's, it's got a long past to look at. Um, this talk really came about because of a presentation that was at last year's LCA in Geelong. Um, the presentation was entitled Life is Better with Rust Community Automation. It was by Emily Dunham of the Mozilla Foundation. She works on Rust. And she gave this brilliant presentation on how Rust uses various forms of automation and other kinds of you know, community interaction things to make their community really nice. And I, I was watching this talk going, man, I wish we could do that. And I'm going, why can't FreeBSD have these nice things? And so I asked her at the end, how could FreeBSD possibly have these nice things? And she looked at me and said, I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and. So it got me to thinking about why FreeBSD couldn't have these nice things. And so I spent a while talking, thinking about it, and now I'm going to tell you why FreeBSD can't have these nice things. <laughs> um, my past with FreeBSD, um, I got involved in FreeBSD way back in the mid-90s. Um, I had discovered Linux, like many people did, and then I went along to a rehearsal of my university choir, and people there told me that I should use FreeBSD instead because Linux was rubbish. And being a university choir, I figured they'd know what they were talking about, and so I did. <laughs> Um, it's worth noting that the person in question here is Mark Newton, who you may have heard of. Um, so that led me running FreeBSD machines at some Adelaide-based ISP that no one had heard of at the time called Internode. Um, and later on, I decided that I really should know how these things work. I'd always been interested in how low-level operating system things worked. So I figured the way to learn that would be to find the deepest end I could find and dive into it. So I bought one of those old plastic shell iMacs, the PowerPC ones, and decided to try and get FreeBSD running on it, which it didn't do at the time. Um, they punished me for that with giving me commit access. Um, that was about 2000. It took about 13 years after that for me to actually get a job that paid me to do stuff with FreeBSD, and I had to move to the US for it. Um, but I quite enjoy working on it, and I think it's a great project. Now, I will warn people, this is going to be a very talky talk. There is not a lot of showing. Um, this is because I'm going to be going through a whole bunch of incidents and stuff that have gone on, a lot of which is on mailing list archives that are intended to be private. They're not for general things, so I can't really pull excerpts all over the place and show people things. So I'm going to be talking people through a lot of events. So I figure I get started with what are the troubles with FreeBSD? First one is FreeBSD is big. The second one is that FreeBSD is old. And the last one is that FreeBSD's leadership can at times be slow and hesitant to act. So going through those in a bit more detail. FreeBSD is big. It may not be the biggest thing out there. I mean, I, I, perversely, I think some of the browsers end up actually larger than FreeBSD, which is a horrifying thought when you think about what you're running on your laptop. But, you know, you don't really get a full Unixy OS in a small source footprint. And that's what FreeBSD is. It's not just a kernel, it's everything. You build it, you can install it, and you can run it. You don't have to get the kernel from there, the shell utils from there, you compile it from over there and mash it all together. It's all there. And so that leads to a large amount of stuff. Um, and it's not just the source, there's also ports and docs as well. Ports is, people may have heard of ports, it's basically a whole bunch of recipes for building third-party software that you can install on FreeBSD. That probably gets more commits on average than source does because there's a lot more things that are being looked after and it's a bit more detached. There's also a document, documentation repository. I'm not going to make the joke about docs. Um, but you know, in terms of size mattering for you know, free, something like FreeBSD, it plays into how well you can manage it and how well you can contribute to it because it's a big thing. If you want to test a change, 
you've got a long build cycle. It takes about, I don't know, it depends on the machine, but I'd say 20 to 30 minutes to build world. Back in the day, it took hours. I think if you checked out a modern FreeBSD on a 386, which is the first platform FreeBSD ran on, it would take days. Um, and then if you want to run tests, then you know, that'll add time. And so you end up with a long build test cycle. And so when you compare against a smaller piece of software, you can't just check in a change and have near immediate feedback on what went wrong. Um, which also comes to FreeBSD as old. It started in November 1993. Um, it was built on top of 386 BSD, which came out in 1992. And that was built on 4.3 BSD Net 2, which came out in 1991. And that, the BSD project has history going back to, I think, the 1970s. And so there's a lot of history there. And a lot of the things that have happened since this came out is that people discovered automated testing. And so, but one of the other things they discovered is that you kind of have to architect your software a certain way to be automatically testable. And one of the things that shouldn't be too hard to get is that automatically testing a kernel can be a bit of fun too. You have to have virtualization, or uh, NetBSD has tricks where they, they pull a bunch of the kernel code out into user space and run it there. But even then, you're going to unit testing your process switch code, which is generally an assembly right at the bottom of the, the code base, is it's going to be a bit interesting. Um, we do have some tests now. A lot of them we got from NetBSD. Um, a lot of those are focused, a lot of the ones we've got are focused around user land code rather than kernel code. Um, and just speaking of the original BSD project, I did actually get in touch with uh, Kirk McCusick, who was one of the original University of California at Berkeley FreeBSD developers, uh, sorry, not FreeBSD, BSD developers, um, and asked them what they had. They used a, a source code tool, it's called SCCS, you can actually get that as open source now, but it was proprietary within the AT&T Unix uh, stuff at the time, which is why FreeBSD didn't use it. Uh, they didn't have any bug tracking, they just had a mailing list, and a guy called Keith Bostick, who went on to uh, uh, found sleep, co found Sleepy Cat, which developed the Berkeley DB um, source code. Um, he triaged that list and would then hand bugs around if they needed to. Um, distributions were often done by posting tapes. Um, and patches generally arrived via tape or via email once email arrived. Um, and once remote logins were a thing, which they weren't originally, we're talking about the 1980s here, uh, some trusted people given logins to the machine hosting the repository and allowed to make their own commits. And that control of that was done by a group of about four people that managed the project, including Kirk and Keith and others. So looking at the last issue, FreeBSD's leadership can be slow or hesitant to act. Community groups are often consensus driven. Um, Linux describes itself as consensus driven. Um, FreeBSD's Freebs leadership is a nine person core team elected from the ranks of the active committers by active committers. An active committer is defined as, is defined as someone who was committed in the last 12 months. Core tends to be very consensus driven, partly because it doesn't want to be seen as, seen as picking sides within the community and for other various reasons. Um, and some of those are, are also due to history, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, so yeah, it doesn't want to take sides, it doesn't want to be in control of architectural direction. There was a lot of argument at one point um, in the original formation of the FreeBSD core team that they were kind of a cabal that would make these decisions uh, that were in their own interest and not everybody else's. And I think that led to a real vibe in the later core teams of not wanting to be the architectural arbiters of FreeBSD because that was not what they felt their point was. The point was that FreeBSD was this large group of smart people and they would be able to come to a consensus on architectural direction of their own. Yes, that works. Um, so speaking more about sort of the core team. So core team were the original four people that, pro that founded the project. That was Jordan Hubbard, uh, Rod Grimes, David Greenman, and one person whose name I didn't write down in here and I've forgotten, I'm really sorry, Nate somebody. Um, the, as time went on, they, they followed the same sort of model as BSD where they would take people who were contributing good quality stuff and give them commit access on the machine that hosted the repository. If they kept doing really good stuff after that, they would punish them by dragging them into the core team. Um, and so the core team had grown reasonably large, and so we're talking, so 
project starts in 1993. We're talking about 2000. A lot of these people are getting either burnt out or they've just disappeared. And also all the stuff about core team is an unelected cabal that answers to itself and doesn't do the right thing by us had all come around. And so they decided to fix this by changing the core team model to an elected model. So they wrote up a bunch of bylaws as to how we would run an election and they duly ran an election and from about 2000 onwards we've had the nine person core team that gets elected either every two years or when the membership drops below seven people. And this has been doing all right, but as I said, consensus driven and so it can be a little bit slow to get things done. It can be interesting to talk about the wider scope of project leadership. I mean, you could also talk about your benevolent dictator for lifestyle models like Python and like Linux. Um, I don't think it makes a huge difference in some cases. There are some events, and some of those I'll get into a bit later, where no matter what your leadership is, it's going to have problems. And also, strong leadership or decisive leadership is not the same as good leadership or nice leadership. And the fact that I'm bringing up Python and Linux here, I think you can look at the difference in personality between Guido Van Rossum and Linus Torvalds and see that you know, there, there are quite different styles in how those people manage their projects. So what I'm going to do now is go through a couple of events in the history of FreeBSD and talk about how they were dealt with and describe what happened and then I'll try and make a few points off the back of those. So tools and processes. The core of every project, well, there are two cores. There's the people and there's the source code. And the source code needs to be looked after. So you have source control. FreeBSD, like every modern forward-thinking pro um, project at the time, used CVS. And that's actually not a ridiculous thing to say because at the time, you know, SCCS came out in 1972 and was written in Snowball. Then they wrote it in C again. Uh, it's open source now, but it certainly wasn't then, so we couldn't use that. RCS came out in 1982. If anyone's run into RCS, it only works on one file at a time. Um, so someone wrote a bunch of shell scripts to make a deal with more than one file at a time and called it CVS. Um, I don't think it's shell scripts anymore, but it was at the, at the start. And then over time, you had a bunch of other ones come out that of various sort of types of awesomeness and various things. That's not a complete list. There are many, many others. So the question is often, why didn't FreeBSD move off CVS sooner? I mean, we're talking 2000 when the new core came in. We had a couple of options there. Um, so CVS we started with. CVS, I don't know. How, who here has actually used CVS in anger? Oh my god. So, <laughs> So many scars. <laughs> Hands up who deeply, deeply loves CVS's ability to branch and merge. <laughs> that person there has Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> um, so FreeBSD, having realised how excellent CVS branches were, used them for, for precisely one thing, which was release engineering. Um, we had a, a sta you had the head of development, you had a stable branch, and releases came off that stable branch. That, that model evolved over time. Initially, it was just one stream of development, and everyone was told, stop doing what you're doing right here so we can do a release. And everyone eventually worked out that was really irritating, and so then it became, stop what you're doing for a little bit while we do a stable branch, and then keep going. Um, and that was that would do pretty well. I mean, it also tied in with the, the fact that a lot of the support for FreeBSD at the time was coming from a company that sold CD-ROM images of FreeBSD. Um, and they like to have nice regular releases so they can sell them. Um, so, but you know, eventually better options came along. Um, and it took FreeBSD a very long time to get to it. And part of it was, to what? I mean, in 2000, you obviously had things like Subversion showing up. Um, BitKeeper was an option at that point, uh, but it was proprietary. Um, several years later, you had things like Git and Mercurial and Darks and Monotone and, and every other person's attempt at a DVCS. Um, and there were lots and lots of arguments there. But like I said, FreeBSD is very consensus driven and no one could come to consensus. And so the usual idea was, okay, well, I'll prove to you that we can do this. I mean, it really comes down to how you end up getting agreement on it. In a lot of cases, it's if someone does the work, then they can push an argument that that's what it does. And so some people would do test conversions of um, 
of the, the source tree to a new thing. But these things involve large extract transform load operations. You can lose data. You have to plan them out really carefully. And another fun bit is because FreeBSD's repository is so big, a lot of those tools would just fail. Um, so this was, a, this was a bit that I felt comfortable lifting out of one of the repositories. This was, um, this was a quote from Peter Wem, who moved the FreeBSD project to Subversion. You'll notice that the year there is 1999. We moved to Subversion in 2008. Um, there'd been a lot of discussion, like every once in a while. It was one, of, you know, how I'm pretty sure everyone who's been involved in an open source community here you have the perennial arguments that show up on your mailing lists. Like, I'm sure Python people love hearing about the Gil. Um, I'm sure Django people love hearing about SQL Alchemy. Um, so on and so forth. This was one of the perennials. Everyone, every once in a while, someone would go and say, "Oh, I've I, I tried using Git and it's wonderful." Um, we, we should switch to Git, at which point everyone would jump on them saying, no Mercurial, no Subversion, no anything but Git, um, all those kind of things. So they tried converting it. Sometimes the tools needed fixing because some, a lot of things that naive source code conversion tools do is try and keep all the metadata in memory. And I don't know if you noticed, but the Subversion repository is 3.1 gigabytes in size. And yeah, it didn't work. Um, Peter Wem is uh, quoted here because he's the person who actually ended up converting it to subversion. And what, he, what happened with that was he basically decided that he'd had enough of this. And he had the keys to the repository server and you could all get stuffed. <laughs> and he put some thought into it. He tried out Git and Mercurial. He'd also tried, seen how some other people were trying to use these tools in other places. And he came to the conclusion at the time that both Git and Mercurial wouldn't deal with a project of our size, just in terms of raw stuff that's in the repository which is probably fair enough at the time. Things might be different now. And there is a FreeBSD um, repo on GitHub now. Um, but it's, you know, he decided that these just wasn't going to work. Subversion fixed the biggest problem that we had is that CVS does, does not have commit atomicity. When you change, change a bunch of files, it's a bunch of individual commits to those files. Subversion fixed that by giving a sub, uh, commit atomicity. Its branching was better than CVS, which is very low bar. <laughs> Um, but you could also use Git and Mercurial and whatever and others as a front end of Subversion and so it would let people who wanted to use Git or Mercurial use those instead of Subversion if they so wanted. And so he set about doing it and I've seen his notes on, on how he did it and it took a lot of work. He had to do the CVS to SVN run and then he had to go through and fix up a bunch of things, patch up various things because we did things like we would in order to preserve history on a, on a rename, we would copy the RCS file um, because that way you'd still retain the history of the file. And we did, and there are other things too, like there, the, he found corruption in our CVS repository. So that was all kinds of fun. Um, so yeah, he started doing this quietly and then when he basically had it ready to go, he presented it as a fait accompli, said, right, we're doing this now. And once that actually happened, once he stood up and said, we're doing this, it all just went through fairly easily and people didn't seem to complain too much. I mean, some people kind of muttered the mm, git mm, mercurial, but not enough that it would actually cause a problem. So I looked at this and went, you know, eight or nine, eight and a half years to do a, uh, a change in SCM tool seems pretty impressive. And so I went and looked around a bit for other people who'd gone through this. Python. Python started in CVS. I don't know if it was hosted on SourceForge originally, but then it was on SourceForge. They've gone from there. They moved to, Subver to CVS on Subversion. They moved, so, sorry, CVS on SourceForge to Subversion self-hosted in 2004, and then to Mercurial self-hosted in 2009, and now they're on GitHub. So I think they beat us in being able to do this. Better. And part of the reason why they do that is that they have things like the PEP process. Um, has anyone come across Python's uh, Python enhancement uh, process? A few. PEP is, PEP is heavily documented, funnily enough, in PEP1. Um, but it's a bit like the RFC system. The gist is you write a PEP. There's a group of PEP editors who can help you get your PEP up to a submittable standard. You submit your PEP for consideration and then either Guido as benevolent dictator for life or one of his chosen delegates, possibly in consultation with others, will decide whether it goes ahead or not. That's the very short version. 
But the thing is that PEPs can cover a whole raft of things. They can cover changes to the standard library, they can ca cover changes to the language, they can cover changes to CPython, they can cover changes to programming conventions, style, or even the development process of Python itself. So if you want to make a change in Python, there's an obvious process for you to go through to try and make that change happen. Um, which is why PEP is good. It's not the only community with a process kind of like that, but it's a it's really good way of formalizing your requests for change. It, makes, it forces you to think about it and make sure that your, your argument is, is well stated. And it makes, makes you think it through because you're going to have to, you know, this document is going to be read by everyone who's then going to come and tell you why you're wrong. And so you need to make sure that you're not wrong. And assuming that your leadership is, you know, keeps up with this process, which, you know, Python does because it's not just Guido, he can delegate. Um, then things proceed quite nicely and once they're approved then you've got the imprimatur of the project leadership behind you and you can just go. So the other one I looked at is uh, Django. Django moved from self-hosted subversion to GitHub. They don't have a process like PEP but they have a smaller development body and you have a subset of those that are really active at any given point. And their switch kind of happened when the people who were active realized they were using GitHub for everything except Django and basically said, we're moving now. And the rest of the leadership said, yeah, okay. Um, and that's kind of one of the advantages of being somewhat smaller than FreeBSD. So what could have been done better in this process? The first one I think is because Core doesn't want to be seen as the arbiter of architectural direction in the process, uh, in the project, they don't feel like they should take sides in an argument like this. And so the way that they would deal with it is they'd say, off you go, do a proof of concept. And that would be generally fairly effective at shutting them up. Which is not always what you want. Um, I don't know whether Core in FreeBSD could have done this one better. I think the only thing that would have made it faster would be picking sides, but would that have caused uh, undue project angst, I don't know. If we had a process like PEP in place, that could be interesting. Retrofitting a process like PEP onto an existing project um, runs the risk of everyone ignoring it and it just not working. So, and it's not just uh, moving to subversion. We still get t discussions about moving fully to GitHub. We are sort of half on GitHub in that we have a FreeBSD organization with the FreeBSD repository in it but don't bother submitting a pull request because we're unlikely to see it. And that's a problem for me. It's one of the things that I'm pushing personally is that we either need to be all the way on GitHub or all the way off GitHub or at the very least we need to be able to respond to the things that show up on GitHub. So we need some kind of tooling in place that will take pull requests and try and put them into our fabricator instance or something like that. Um, so that's that story. The next two stories involve community interactions. These can be fun. Communities dealing with bad behavior is always going to be fun. Not. Small communities are nice in this regard because everyone can know everyone else. You can say, yeah, oh yeah, I realize you don't agree with that, but here's why I'm doing that. And they can go, oh yeah, all right. Or, however, you, small teams, small communities can talk things out in a much more effective way. FreeBSD's committer base goes up into several hundreds. Now, not all of those are active at any time, but there's enough there that people can get quite bent out of shape over things, and sometimes with good reason. And so sometimes community leadership has to do community HR. HR is, you know, HR in large organizations is not always the most popular group of people, but I've got a friend who refers to HR as lawsuit avoidance. <laughs> they're, they're the people that you need to get involved to make sure that things don't end up in court. And while I don't think any of the FreeBSD things would have, FreeBSD things would have ended up in court, you still need to be able to step into these things and try and break them apart. So from at least the second core, there was a, there's been a document called the Committed's Guide, and it describes how you use Subversion or CVS at the time, and so on and so forth. But there are two sections in it that cover interactions with other developers. First section is entitled Developer Relations, and it contained advice for dealing with developers who are working in the same area as you and things like that. It ended with several paragraphs like this. Things like, do not impugn the intentions of someone you disagree with. If they say, see a different solution to a problem than you, or even a different problem, it's not because they're stupid, because they have questionable parentage, or because they're trying to destroy your hard work, personal image, or free BSD, but simply because they have a different outlook on the world. Different is good. You know, disagree honestly, 
um, accept correction, ask for help. These things, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty good. I mean, this and along with the next bit, you kind of see the beginnings of something that could be a code of conduct. Um, so later in the project, you had the FreeBSD committer's big list of rules. And again, they're things that are fairly sensible. I mean, some of them are kind of specific, like number six here says, you know, don't commit to FreeBSD current, uh, FreeBSD stable before you committed to FreeBSD current. That'll become important a little bit later. But it's really just the, the general kind of things that you want to have in order to make sure that your people are going to get along happily and, and be productive. Um, so following this list, there's a bunch of sort of more interpretive paragraphs describing what core can do in the case that people break those rules, um, which generally amounts to suspending or potentially removing commit access, which it would also tend to cut you off from a bunch of uh, the internal mailing lists. Repo admins could also temporarily suspend you if you're doing really stupid stuff in the repository, which people have done. Uh, someone committed an Emacs core file once. Um, and then there's discussion on the rules and that. And that's basically the sum total of anything that could be described as a code of conduct for the FreeBSD project up until about 2015. So one of the more spectacular incidents in FreeBSD sort of history involved a person by the name of Matthew Dillon. Not the actor Matthew Dillon. He was never a contributor. Um, Matthew Dillon joined the FreeBSD project in 1994. Um, he's extremely talented. He was really good, especially at finding really esoteric bugs in the VM subsystem. And if you've ever tried to find an esoteric bug in the VM subsystem, you'll understand why we like people like that. But team player, not so much. He liked to be in charge. And the thing is, there's nothing wrong with liking to be in charge unless you're in a large volunteer community project. Um, he had a bad habit of believing that his changes were right even when other people told him they were wrong. Um, and that's completely ignoring any subjective nature of right or wrong there. Um, and he often would take charge in a given area to the expense of, at the expense of anyone else working in that area. So here is a bit of technological background for what was happening at the FreeBSD at the time. This is about 2002. FreeBSD 3 and FreeBSD 4, which were, was out at the time, had very basic multiprocessing support. It had a big kernel lock in the same way that Linux did when it first started. Multiple user space processes could be running at any given time, but only one could be at the, in the kernel. We wanted to fix this in FreeBSD 5. Um, at the time, we'd also gained access to not only to the BSD OS source code, which was a commercial version of FreeBSD, which had multiprocessing support. And so we were looking at the way that they did it. And one of the people looking at that was a person by the name of John Baldwin. Uh, John Baldwin is a lovely guy. Uh, he'd, he'd basically gone through and worked out a, a process by which we could start breaking up our giant lock, um, which is called giant, hence the... Um, and he'd written this up into a presentation. He presented it at a conference. Everyone seemed to be going along with it. And um, Matt Dillon got really interested in working in this space too. And so they started working out a way to sort of start breaking this lock up. And it started off fairly well. Um, but then they, they ran into a problem with a, a thing called critical sections. Critical sections are a bit of code where you do not want to be switched out. So you've got a currently running thread, you don't want it to be preempted. And so you mark the section as critical and John had, John's original cut of how that worked just suspended interrupts. So you could not take an interrupt and so you would never get moved off that processor during that section. Matt thought that this was inefficient and committed a change that sort of didn't disable interrupts, it would just um, set a flag that would then tell the low-level interrupt handler just to say that's pending and we'll deal with it when we get out of the critical section. The reason for this was that disabling interrupts on x86 at the time was expensive and Matt didn't like the fact that it was slow. But John pointed out quite rightly that we're not just x86. We also had alpha at the time uh, and I think 64-bit Spark. I don't know if we had multiprocessing on PowerPC yet, but you know, we, had, we had more than one architecture that we were looking at. And that was a very architecture-specific optimization. And some of these changes also violated the machine-independent, machine-dependent parts that he was trying to work on. But, and so this led to them having large, large arguments. And Matt eventually, after a lot of very blunt disagreement, backed out his change because he'd committed this. Paul was then stuck in the middle of a month-long debate between John and Matt over who was right. 
Well, what I actually mean is that John would say, no, this, 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 and this, and Matt would say, get nicked. Um, and eventually, um, Matt, they came to a level of compromise where Matt got his change. Uh, the machine independent, machine independent stuff got fixed up. That change went in, and things kind of calmed down a bit after that. But, you know, when we look at this, we've got a classic Rockstar Ninja 10X developer going on here. Um, digging back through the mail archives, I found a lot of cases where we tried to get Matt to listen to John um, and various things like that, and it just really didn't work. So what is Core going to do about it? So there was a lot of argument going on on the free mail list at this time, and so we ended up with Core ended up posting a lot of rules about how we would suspend people if they were being too mean um, and various things like that. Um, eventually, the problem came to a head where um, Matt committed that. This was in about 2003. Um, it doesn't seem to be too controversial except that it violated some layering stuff and it was also in the middle of just after we'd cut a stable branch for five which would taken a long time to get ready. And eventually he backed it out with that commit. <laughs> and that, and really going through the mail archives, it was really clear he didn't realize that what people were objecting to with that was not the fact that he'd made the change in the first place, it was the message. And eventually Core took his commit bit away. Um, and that was, you know, leadership is hard. And dealing with 10x Rockstar Ninja developers, when you don't, all you've really got to go on is a set of sort of written down rules, is difficult. Had we had a, like a modern form of a code of conduct at that point, then maybe John could have raised something off that, or someone else could have raised something off the back of that, but yeah. But anyway, after he went, things calmed down for a while until Gamergate came along. My candidate for the most obvious and least controversial statement in history, Gamergate was a burning trash pile made of other burning trash piles. <laughs> I'm not going to go into what Gamergate actually was, save that it kicked off in the gaming community and rapidly became something that was very hard to avoid on Twitter. But one of the people who figured in Gamergate was Randy Harper. Now, Randy Harper used to be a FreeBSD developer. She did a bunch of work on the installer, which was a really annoying piece of software, and so we were really grateful for it. And the person who was mentoring it proposed it for a commit bit, which she got. Then she got a job at Amazon, and Amazon is famous for making you work very hard, and she didn't have a lot of time for FreeBSD anymore, and so she kind of dropped out, but she still hung around the community quite a lot. Randy was working at a gaming company doing DevOps stuff when Gamergate kicked off. Randy, as she is wont to do, started getting into it with some of the garbage humans of Gamergate. And as the garbage humans of Gamergate are wont to do, they started dogpiling her and being the truly wonderful human beings that we came to know them as. Randy decided, while drunk one night, to try and get rid of them with a Perl script. <laughs> and so she wrote GT Autoblocker. Um, and it turned out to be really good at blocking them, which of course made them lose their goddamn minds. Um, and so they stepped up their harassment campaign and started targeting everything to do with her, including FreeBSD. Um, Core started receiving emails asking us to do something about Randy in about 2014 and saying that she was bringing the name of FreeBSD into disrepute and she was horrible and she was a misandrist. And <sighs> um, but at the time, it was clearly not FreeBSD related and so we just told them, you know, she is a person, she can do person things and so go off and be a human for a change. Um, Randy would also tip us off if she could see someone who was about to start making trouble because they would try and get into some of our private like key protected at the IRC channels by pretending to be her. This is all fun. Um, but the problem really kicked off when a FreeBSD committer started joining in on the Gamergate side. Um, so he was a ports committer, not a source committer, but that's not really important in this. Um, they, he started attacking her on Twitter, she attacked back because this is Randy, um, and it escalated onto one of the private IRC channels. When, so I remember being on there at, at the time and they got quite heated, but then this guy leaked the log of the channel, which is specifically stated as something you're not to do, and he leaked it to my, Milo Yiannopoulos of Breitbart. And if you don't know who those names are, I, I keep it that way. <laughs> 
at that point, Core had to get involved. We had one committer going against another committer. And Randy stated that she wanted three things out of this in, in her sort of notice of what was going on. She wanted an official project code of conduct. She wanted a public statement saying that we were investing, that, well, that Core was investing the, investigating the behavior and that that didn't stand for harassment and committed to being inclusive, et cetera, et cetera. And the last one, that the person be quietly removed from the project. And she stressed quietly. She didn't want to make it a big deal that they'd been kicked out. She just wanted something done about it. Core responded that the code of conduct was in progress, but sanctioning the developer was a bit tricky during where, uh, due to where it happened. Pre uh, policing your own internal places is easy. Um, the, but the harassment on Twitter, but also Reddit and Facebook and various other things, is a bit harder. Can you revoke someone's access to a project based on things they've done in what is essentially a neutral space? Um, and there was a bunch of debate about that. Um, it's hard to really work out what to do, but in the end it became a moot point because he, I think he realized which way the wind was blowing and resigned. Um, and you know, that kind of put the, closed the door on that, although it took a lot longer than it really should have. And if we had a modern code of conduct in place, then that would have been a much more of a slam dunk. Core did try to make good on its code of conduct promise, but again, it, it, this is where it ties into FreeBSD being old. The code of conduct that we have now is a patched up version of the initial rush job, and it was a rush job. One of the things that I find interesting about FreeBSD in terms of it being old is it still thought that meritocracy was a good word. <laughs> and it was genuine. They thought meritocracy meant inclusiveness. Like, we don't, care how, you don't, we don't care where you've come from or who you are or what you are. If you can code, then you can come in. That's what they thought meritocracy meant. Um, it, and it, to their credit, a lot of people, when actually confronted with the idea that this wasn't what it meant these days, did actually get on board with that, do the research, find out, oh, oh, I see what you mean, and back off. Um, we've got a new one in the works, and I'm hoping that one's going to be a lot better received. It'll be out once we've worked out how the enforcement process will work. But the fallout from this was pretty impressive. Randy wrote a long blog post about how terribly we'd handled this. And yeah, she ripped us a new one in it. And the thing is that a lot of what she said, while it is very sort of forthright, a lot of it I think is, it, there's, there's a level of validity to it that we really needed to learn from. And I think, you know, we're getting there. So. That's it for the stories. How do we fix the troubles with FreeBSD? So just to restate, FreeBSD is big. I don't know if this will ever get fixed in a project named FreeBSD. Someone could take our code and make a stripped down thing to run on something smaller or change the way it works. It wouldn't be FreeBSD per se, but it would be the same code and that would be fine. FreeBSD itself could do a few things. I mean, think, we still have SendMail in our base system and you know, that's probably not necessary these days especially since we have, you know, several other MTAs in ports. There are often discussions on, you know, our, one of our recurring discussions in FreeBSD these days is how do we break up FreeBSD into a bunch of installable packages so that you don't have to install the whole thing at once. These don't f um, fix the build, test in build install test cycle thing so much unless you've got things like incremental builds, but people are working on that as well. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on. And to be honest, this is one, way, one place where people could help us. If you're interested in things like automation and testing and virtual machines and all that kind of stuff, FreeBSD is wide open for that kind of stuff. And if you were interested in doing any of that, come and talk to me because I will, I will hook you up with people and I will mentor you, myself, mentor you myself if you need it. That's my email address. Come and find me. Um, FreeBSD is old. It's not exactly going to get any younger, but really the issue there is that changing community attitudes is hard when they're baked in. Um, the source code discussion is one of those. People don't want to move to GitHub because we're really attached to having things on infrastructure we control. And there are ways that we could work around that, but there would have to be an attitude shift before everyone really accepted it. Um, and the last one, FreeBSD's leadership. This, this is fixable, I think, but it would require an attitude shift on behalf of Core. I am on Core. I, I probably do with a bit of an attitude shift towards being more active as well. I think. But the thing is that I don't think we need to necessarily be the architectural leaders of the project. What we need to be is the leaders of the, the scaffolding of the project. We need to make sure that all the things that the project needs to do a good job are present and available. Um, and so you know, we can take leadership not necessarily on what FreeBSD is going to be, but how we make it. 
and reducing friction for developers and all that kind of stuff. And really this leads to what I think is actually the real trouble with FreeBSD. We're all volunteers. Nobody I know has a job description. This ties into Nadia Eggball's keynote this morning. Nobody I know has a job description that is purely make FreeBSD more awesome. I know lots of people with a job of make FreeBSD more awesome for my employer's specific needs. But they're not always the things that are going to make FreeBSD more awesome all the way into the future. Because in a lot of cases, you know, if FreeBSD has a faster build cycle, that helps them a bit, but it's not a huge thing because they've probably already got something in place that does that. Um, expanding the test frameworks around FreeBSD is something that's good. And this is somewhere where I think my employer deserves a huge amount of credit because they've, my, my bosses are very keen to make FreeBSD more testable and more validated because it really helps them because we're ingesting Free, FreeBSD's head these days. And so we want to make sure that that's as tested and validated as we can get. Um, and yeah, we need to make sure that FreeBSD is a fun and awesome place because that is a way that FreeBSD will be around for a good many years to come. So with that, I would like to give some thanks to Kirk McCusick for answering my, uh, my questions about old BSD. Also Jordan Hubbard for answering my questions about old FreeBSD. Russell Keith McGee for answering my questions about Django. And Nick Coglin for answering my questions about Python. Uh, Isilon is hiring. We're hiring lots of different roles. Uh, you can contact me or you can contact Stuart who manages the team in Melbourne. Um, if you're interested in moving to Seattle, we might be able to talk about that. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benno. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if anybody has any, hands up. There is. Hang on a second. It's not really a question. It's going to be a <laughs> no, question. it's not a question. Boo. No. Um, <laughs> Come and talk to me after. Are there are there any actual questions? So does anyone have a question that needs to he be said, asked? Are you I promise. It doesn't matter. If it's not a form of a question, if you want to submit a paper next year, go yeah. right ahead. Uh, does anyone have a question? Okay, I will ask a question so you don't have completely hanging. Um, hey. Part of the, you mentioned a couple of times there is like there was the first core and the second core. There yep. evidently have been yep. great big uh, epochal shifts in the in the core team. There's only been or, one sort of epochal shift, and that was from the the invited core to the elected core. Right. Okay. Um, it sounds like some of the problems that you're having now might be addressed by changing the way core works. How, uh, we how did, this, how did the change once. happen last time and how do you manifest that in the future? So the bylaws that we have, um, we did actually try to change them once and it was to a kind of rolling elected core. So instead of having nine people that were elected every two years, you'd have three people elected in overlapping two-year terms. So you'd end up with nine people again, but it, it was trying to avoid burnout because what we were finding is that after two years, people would, t would tend to get a bit sort of over it and would need to be replaced. And that led to, I think, the, we did have an early election in core once where it dipped below seven people. And so, yeah, I think the, pr the problem was that that failed in the same way that um, a lot of non-compulsory um, elections fail and that we didn't get enough turnout. Have we got time for one more? Yes. Uh, you, you say... <laughs> You, you, didn't mention oh, oh, yeah. you, you said that um, you felt that nobody was paying for people to make FreeBSD better. Why do you think that is? What, what has caused that situation? So FreeBSD has never had a red hat. That's part of it. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the realm of people who are paying to do work on things like kernels and operating systems, you've got two broad categories. You've got people like, um, trying to think of someone, um, no. okay, so you've got people like Red Hat, SUSE, like that, who sell Linux distributions and so they care about Linux as a whole in a very kind of holistic sense. But then um, I'm drawing a blank on, on companies that do things like this with Linux. Well, okay, let's take IoT devices. I, IoT devices, um, people who sell those care about getting Linux running on tiny little MIPS chips and then they care about connecting it to an internet port somewhere and then they care about selling it to you and then they care about, oh God, we're going out of business because our product's a gaping security hole. Um, but they don't really care about fixing Linux for everyone else. As long as it works for them, they're fine. And so GPL gives you some 
expectation that they'll give their patches back. It doesn't always happen, which is why you have lawsuits. Um, but in FreeBSD, there's no requirement to do that at all. The BSD license basically says you get to take it. If it breaks, you get to keep both pieces and keep our name out of it. Um, and so you get companies that will use FreeBSD but not necessarily contribute much. Um, my company, I'm glad to say, is the opposite. We consume FreeBSD and we give back a fair amount. We don't give a lot in the form of raw cash, but we devote a lot of person hours to it and we support things like conferences and things like that. Um, other companies are similar. Netflix, for example. If you watch the videos from Netflix, all the bits that you're making of the video that you see come off a FreeBSD box. And they have a very active team who are trying to push their changes up and make FreeBSD a better place. Um, other places that have used FreeBSD, though, we don't see a lot more out of, like uh, Yahoo, for example, used FreeBSD for a very long time. Now, they paid for some people. Peter Wem was an, still is an employee of Yahoo, um, and he did a lot of incredible work, but I don't know if they... They, they weren't really focused on upstream very much. Unfortunately, that we are out of time now. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for your presentation. Thank a you very much. A small token of appreciation from the uh, organisers. Thank you. Everyone, please give that a warm round of applause.